have a very interesting topic today that uh, I'm sure all of you are familiar with or, or you wouldn't be in this session, dealing with the disparate impact, <clears throat> which is really quite different from, uh, make the distinction, very different from disparate treatment, which is, you know, your sort of standard discrimination case where something was intended to be discriminatory or that's the claim and then the uh, there's a prima facie case and then the employer takes the position that uh, uh, was for business reasons legitimate reasons and then the plaintiff uh, will come back with how that's really not the case and that that's a mask and pretextual and so on that's kind of your typical discrimination case as opposed to what we're dealing with here today which is disparate impact which focuses on consequences uh, not uh, intended discrimination not intended uh, discriminatory motive and where there are challenges to facially neutral employment practices uh, that are fair uh, in form but potentially discriminatory in operation and, and that's really what we're going to be focusing on today. Um, and uh, what we'll do is make our presentations, uh, and, I, and I think the presenters will f sort of focus on different areas that will help us um, with question questions later on and a better understanding of what is really a pretty tri tricky uh, topic. And so what we'll do is we'll start off with uh, Gail Harriet here on my left, and then we'll talk with uh, Jim Scanlon and talk then with J Jim Sharp. Uh, I've been in this sort of general area of the law in sort of one form or another for a lot of years, like going all the way back to I guess most notably 1969 when I was with now Judge Silverman in the uh, Labor Department as his assistant and spent many hours in the evenings with him formulating the Philadelphia plan and uh, ultimately defending it in 1969 and 1970 and persuading the Justice Department to buy it and so on. And so uh, I go all the way back to uh, the Nixon administration goals and timetables. So I've been watching this whole area evolve, as has uh, Gail, who is a professor at, uh, of law at the University of San Diego in California and a member of the U.S. Uh, Civil Rights uh, Commission on Civil Rights and has considerable academic hill private uh, practice experience uh, with long involvement in civil rights, affirmative action, and employment law, and was uh, formerly the uh, Civil Rights Council of the United States Senate Committee on the Judiciary, and has written on subjects of uh, interest uh, to us today. So uh, we'll proceed then. If Gail, if you would like to take the floor, that would be helpful. I think I'm going to use the lectern here. Okay. Good. You know, I've been walking around this morning uh, repeating the words of John Greenleaf Whittier uh, in my mind, words that my grandfather was especially fond of. He said, for all the sad words of tongue or pen, the saddest are these, it might have been. <laughs> Which is, in a sense, what we're talking about today. All the innovations that didn't happen, the tiny incremental ones um, that are so necessary to progress, as well as the big breakthroughs that are pretty darn rare. They could have happened, and somehow should have. Sometimes it's really clear what the thing that might have been was, like the late race uh, for the Republican presidential nomination. <laughs> It could have been, insert your favorite candidate here, 
Um, but when we talk about innovation, it can be really hard. Serious roadblocks to innovation, as opposed to roadblocks to the implementation of a particular innovation, block our vision entirely. History unfolds without disclosing its innovative alternatives. Uh, we can only guess what might have been. Well, our topic today is well-meaning employment discrimination laws and the ways in which they have helped kill off innovative thinking in an area we don't usually think of as innovative, personnel decisions. Uh, a byproduct of these laws has been bland uniformity um, so that even the tiny incremental good ideas from the personnel department um, are fewer than they otherwise would have been. Let me start by saying that employment discrimination law started out with a very limited but very important purpose. The background law was the presumption of employment at will uh, in which an employ employer could hire or fire for good reason, bad reason, or no reason at all, as they say. Uh, and Title VII amended that to eliminate the employer's discretion as to certain grounds, but supposedly left everything else uh, as it was before. As Representative William McCulloch, who was instrumental in the passage of Title VII, put it, uh, I'm quoting him here, internal affairs of employers and labor organizations must not be interfered with, except to the very limited extent that correction is required in discrimination practices. It never quite worked out to be just a surgical removal of certain forbidden grounds and nothing else, but I think it's fair to say um, that initially, at least, the problems uh, were manageable uh, and not of the innovation-killing variety. Uh, the rise of disparate impact law was something else entirely. It created much greater problems. Starting in 1973 with the well-known case of Griggs versus Duke Power Company, the Supreme Court told us that not only can employers be liable for treating job applicants differently, whether consciously or unconsciously, on the basis of race, sex, etc., but also, regardless of intent, for using job qualifications that have a disparate impact on some protected group unless that use of that job qualification um, can be justified by a, quote, business necessity, a term that was never adequately defined. I should say that I would be willing to bet every drop of blood in my body that this is not what Congress intended. Still, for the purposes of this talk, at least, it's water under the bridge. Right now, I want to focus on the consequences of disparate impact liability on innovative hiring techniques. One persistent problem with disparate impact liability is that all job qualifications have a disparate impact on some protected group. Uh, men on average are stronger than women. Women on average are better at fine, fine handiwork than men are. Um, Chinese and Korean Americans on average score higher on measures of math aptitude. Hispanics are more likely to have the skills and physique necessary to be championship jockeys. And for reasons that weirdly enough have to do with Tippi Hedren, the star of Alfred Hitchcock's movie The Birds, Vietnamese Americans are much more likely to have experience in the manicure industry than other Americans. There are hundreds, maybe thousands of religions and national origin groups out there, two sexes, at least, I'm told now, and several races. Uh, that means all job qualifications are presumptively illegal. All of them. Either the EEOC or sometimes a disappointed job applicant, although I'll add they make these lawsuits difficult on, on job applicants, can find a ground to sue if they look hard enough. The best strategy for any employer then is number one, don't attract the EEOC's attention. Don't have them looking at you. And that means avoid really innovative um, kinds of job qualifications. Even simple things like posting job openings online was initially met with quite a lot of resistance. Uh, not everyone had a computer and hence, of course, disparate impact. What's more, all too often since the 1970s, hiring has become shrouded in secrecy. Transparency is, of course, an invitation to a lawsuit. Some examples of job qualifications the EEOC has specially um, come down on are what the EEOC calls paper and pencil tests. 
uh, which used to be more prevalent um, than they are today because of the rise of disparate impact liability. Employers have been forced to shy away from some, from some of them unless they're prepared to knock themselves out to, to demonstrate um, that this particular test does indeed do everything we're supposed to do and to use it is in some sense a business necessity. Um, since uh, other panelists will talk more about that and about the uniform guidelines, I'm not going to other than to say that surely hiring practices would have been different. Probably less focused on having a college degree if the EEOC had not been so particularly um, hard on, on these tests. For those of you who are concerned that the nation may have overinvested in sometimes worthless college degrees, this is part of, not the whole reason, but part of um, our focus on that in, in, in the modern world. Note that college de degree requirements have a disparate impact too. Uh, but for some reason, the EEOC has not gone after them, perhaps because they view the alternatives as worse, um, or perhaps because the higher education industry is part of their in-group. I'll let you decide. All we can say is that definitely there is a disparate impact, but it is not one that has attracted uh, the EEOC's attention. Another interesting innovation that has been beaten back largely by threats of disparate impact liability is the credit check. There are lots of jobs out there where the main qualification that's needed is just a sense of responsibility. You don't need to be a rocket scientist, you don't need to be a physicist, but how do you separate the responsible applicants from the irresponsible ones? A credit check is a very imperfect way to do this, but it's the best thing we got going, uh, or at least among them. He who pays his bills on time is also more likely to be the person who generally fulfills um, his duties as an employee. She too. She too, absolutely. Um, if disparate impact liability has forced some employers to forego specific innovation techniques or to shy away from innovation generally, the Civil Rights Act of 1991 brought in yet another set of concerns increased bureaucratization of the workplace, hypersensitivity to litigation risks, and the resulting tendency towards uniformity of practices. When the culture of every workplace is being forced into the same mold, innovation in the way employees are hired or organized is less likely to occur. Weirdly, all of this is traceable to the 1991's changes in remedies. Uh, available for violations of Title VII. By the way, um, those of you who didn't take remedies in law school because you thought it was only for litigators, that was a mistake. Uh, remedies actually connects to policy, at least in the way I teach it. Originally, the plaintiffs um, in Title VII had two and only two remedies available to them, an injunction or back pay. If you're a non-lawyer, you can rack your brain to try to figure out why, but you will never, ever figure it out. So I'll tell you. Um, this was an, an effort to deny employers jury trials. It was thought that Southern juries might be unsympathetic uh, to racial minorities and to a lesser extent to women, and that, that they would attempt to nullify Title VII. As most lawyers know, the Seventh Amendment guarantees individuals the right to a jury trial in federal civil cases at common law, but not in cases that traditionally would have been litigated before a court of equity. If you don't know what I'm talking about, if you're a non-lawyer, uh, ask somebody, ask a lawyer who knows something about legal history. The bottom line for us is that the original version of Title VII was rigged so that arguably, at least, nobody would have a right to a jury trial. Uh, in 1991, plaintiff's attorneys didn't fear juries anymore. Indeed, they wanted the juries. So damages for loss of dignity, which would, would have triggered a jury trial, um, were made available. Conservatives mostly failed to notice that this would and did open the floodgates to a new kind of Title VII lawsuit. Harassments, especially sexual harassment. Uh, now harassment lawsuits, uh, they existed before, uh, but they were pretty, pretty rare. Um, why were they rare? Because the remedies were not geared to such a problem. Injunctions aren't much help. Having a court order because your superior um, has been hitting on you, having a court order forbidding that is really not the best way to solve that problem. It's too heavy handed. Uh, the ability to get back pay is not usually, usually useful either. It's irrelevant because except in extraordinary cases, um, the harassed employee didn't lose any pay. 
Uh, back then, self-help was the norm. Most employees being harassed would have either stared daggers at the person harassing them, um, would have told the offender to get lost, uh, would have reported the offender uh, to the superior, uh, or would have gotten a transfer or just gotten another job sometimes. But once the 1991 Act went, went into effect, uh, the employee who had been fired for any reason, um, both those who'd actually been harassed and those who just wanted to make it up out of spite could sue for money damages. So suddenly it became lucrative uh, to, be able to, to be able to say, hey, I have been subjected to a hostile environment. Suddenly any contribution to that hostile environment, a joke that fell flat, a photo of a bikini clad spouse of a colleague on that colleague's desk, an unwelcome compliment could be used in a court of law as evidence of a hostile environment. Uh, this caused a revolution in employment practices of which you are no doubt familiar, one in which the risk-averse risk employers instruct their employees, don't even think about complimenting your colleague on her new dress. If, if you think it's gotten out of hand, you're not alone. Polls indicate that most Americans agree with you. Um, to me, at least, it's the growth of the workplace bureaucracy that's most alarming here. More rules, more formality, more training programs instructing employees not to joke about training programs even. <sighs> training programs that have inevitably tell employees, hey, if a problem comes up, refer the matter immediately to your expert human resources office. Don't try to deal with it yourself. Whether you work for a convent, a bank, a logging camp or a topless bar, the law is, is the same. Um, so, you know, many foreign observers from Tocqueville on down have commented on what I consider to be a cultural characteristic of Americans. We're good at spontaneous organization, at improvisation, otherwise known as tiny, temporary, quick, do-it-yourself innovations. We're good at cooperating with each other to get a job done without the need for explicit directions from a person who is officially in charge. That's a real asset, not just to the civic organizations that Tocqueville discussed, but in workplaces too. I just wonder whether those cultural traits can survive in the present legal environment. Let me close by saying this. American workers are not the cheapest ones out there. We don't aspire to be. We compete on other bases, including our ability to work, work well together, to take initiative, and including our strong rule of law values, uh, which is just the opposite of our present, everything is presumptively illegal. You better be prepared to show that you had a business necessity, which is our situation with disparate impact. If we're losing those qualities, we're losing something very precious. Thank you, Gail. Um, well, I will kind of switch to um, uh, Jim Scanlon, an attorney in Washington and uh, very experienced in litigating both government and private uh, party discrimination cases, uh, in particular with respect to disparate impact, and uh, which Jim will discuss and, uh, are his views about the use and misuse of statistics the clash between government agency encouraged steps to reduce adverse outcomes while at the same time monitoring compliance in terms of percentage differences in adverse outcomes. So Jim, uh, why don't you take the floor and I think you're going to use the uh, yes, display as well. based on a statistical understanding that is the exact opposite of reality. 
And that has led to a situation where the government has long encouraged entities covered by civil rights laws to engage in conduct that increases the chances that the government will sue them for discrimination. Still waiting, but uh, my topics involve the measurement of differences between outcome rates, both for determining whether uh, some difference should be large or small, and for determining whether one difference is smaller than another for purposes of satisfying the requirement that an entity that has a disparate impact seek out a, the least discriminatory alternative. Um, the key point involves the fact that the government has long been encouraging entities covered by civil rights laws to relax standards and otherwise reduce the frequency of adverse outcomes in order to reduce percentage differences at which groups experience those outcomes. But reducing the frequency of an outcome does not tend to reduce percentage differences in outcome rates. It tends to increase them. Um, <clears throat> I should at this point say that what I will be talking about here is both not so easy to understand and not so easy to believe. And the better you understand it, the harder it will be to believe. <laughs> Jim, why don't, why don't we find out? Is, is this I'm at the point display, where I do need is this to display. going to be corrected or not? I mean, either we have prospects for correction or we don't. This has a disparate impact on your presentation. John, I can jump in if you want. Let's just see. Should we put the, the, the order? Um. There we go. There we go. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so let's see if this. Okay. These I've points I've gone over and. Because what I say here is not so easy to understand when I give it in several minutes, um, this presentation is available online on my website, on the publications page, the presentation subpage, or by that URL, which is not of much use to you at this point. And it'll be sufficiently annotated that you can, uh, I think, fully understand everything I'm trying to communicate here. Table 1A, it shows a situation of a test where the advantage group, uh, pass rate for the advantage group, AG, is 80%, and the pass rate for the disadvantage group is 63%. So the advantage group's pass rate is 1.27 times the disadvantage group's pass rate. And that is to say the AG rate is 27% higher. So there's a difference in pass rates. Now let's lower the cutoff score to a point where 95% of AG passes. With this lower cutoff, assuming normal test score distributions, the pass rate for DG would be 87%. So now the ratio of the AG to G DG pass rate is only 1.09. That's to say we have reduced the uh, difference in pass rates from 27% at the higher pass rate to 9% at the lower, at the lower cutoff rather. Now I have to make a slight digression, digression here simply because there exists the uniform guidelines for employee selection procedures which measures disparities with the disadvantage group rate of, for the favorable outcome as the numerator. I have that over there in the yellow. And when you do it that way, the lower the ratio, the larger the relative difference. So regardless of, this is just a difference in measurement. Regardless of how you measure it, if you lower the cutoff, you reduce the relative difference in pass rates. This has nothing to do with my key point here, but I have to say it in order to, go, <coughs> to avoid the confusion that may be 
in the minds of persons who are used to dealing with the 80% rule of the Uniform Guidelines and Employee Selection Procedures. I now return to my original illustration of this point, showing that lowering a cutoff reduces relative differences <clears throat> in pass rates. This is widely known, and it underlies the common understanding that lowering a test cutoff tends to reduce the disparate impact of an employment test. Um, it also underlies the general notion that more stringent standards are harder on minorities than less stringent standards. I, that's what I just said. But there's also a part of the picture that virtually no one understands, and that is that lowering a cutoff tends to increase relative differences in failure rates. This is the same illustration I had before, except now I've added the in the failure rates. I have over there in the penultimate column the same thing I showed before that shows how lowering the cutoff reduces the relative difference in pass rates. But now I've added the red highlighted column at last column, which shows how lowering the cutoff increased the relative difference in failure rates. The ratio of DG's failure rate to AG's failure rate was initially 1.85, now it's 2.60. This is a pattern whereby when you reduce the frequency of an outcome, you reduce relative differences in avoiding the outcome, but in Increased relative differences in experience in the outcome is not peculiar to test score data or to the numbers I chose to illustrate it. Rather, inherent in the features of normal distributions of risk factors is a pattern whereby the rarer an outcome, the greater tends to be the relative difference in experiencing it, and the smaller tends to be the relative difference in avoiding it. I've been writing about this in about 200 places since 1987. And uh, I sometimes have called it interpretive rule one or heuristic rule X. And some scholars in the UK call it Scanlon's rule. I encourage that usage among other ways by <laughs> having about 25 web pages, a Scanlon's rule main web page and about 25 sub pages discussing the nuances of the the patterns by which measures tend to be affected by the frequency of an outcome and the implications of the failure to understand these patterns in the interpretation of group differences in the law and the social and medical sciences. Now, some of the implications of the failure to understand interpretive rule one include these lending disparities for at least 20 years, the federal government has been encouraging lenders to relax lending standards in order to reduce the several fold differences in things like mortgage rejection rates that are commonly observed. Relaxing lending standards tends to reduce relative differences in approval rates, but it tends to increase relative differences in rejection rates. Unaware of the latter fact, the government has continued to monitor the fairness of practices on the basis of relative differences in adverse outcomes. Thus, lenders who follow the government encouragements to relax standards tend to increase the chances that the government will sue them for discrimination. School discipline disparities, the same thing. For several years, the government has been encouraging the relaxing of discipline standards in order to reduce relative differences in suspension and expulsions. But it increases them, and all across the country, school districts that have, been, that have been relaxing their standards have been observing increased relative differences in, in, dif in discipline rates, puzzling over why that is happening. And it should, one should expect it to happen. Arrest disparities. Um, Lately, a lot of attention has been given to the quite substantial relative differences in, in arrest rates of whites in various minority groups. And the thought is that this is a consequence of over-policing. But if you have less policing and reduce general arrest rates, you tend to increase, not decrease, 
relative differences in arrest rates. And people commonly draw inferences on the basis of the fact that one relative, that the relative difference in the outcome they happen to be looking at is larger in one setting than another. They draw these inferences without recognizing that the relative difference in the opposite outcome would support a dramatically different, or would commonly support a dramatically different interpretation. Um, probably never in human history has anyone drawn a correct, a statistically sound inference based on the comparative size of two relative differences. In employment, um, arrest and conviction uh, policies of refusal to hire for arrest or conviction are commonly measured in terms of relative differences in disqualification rates. And the government urges employers to narrow the, um, uh, the disqualification requirement. But the more you narrow the requirement, the larger tends to be the relative difference in disqualification rates. Same thing holds for credit checks. Lower the credit score requirement, you increase, in, in lending, lower the credit score requirement, you increase the relative difference in failing to meet the requirement. Same thing happens if you narrow your, your credit requirements for an employee. If you have a policy of refusal to hire a person with two garnishments, well, the, the relative difference in adverse outcomes increases if you change that to three garnishments. Performance and discipline standards are invariably measured in terms of relative difference in termination rates for failure to uh, meet the standards. But the more you relax the standards, the, in fact, the more, the better training you have, the, anything that tends to reduce or tends to increase the rates at which people perform well on the job, will tend to um, reduce the relative differences in rates at which they perform satisfactorily, but will tend to increase the relative differences in rates at which they fail to perform satisfactorily. Um, oh, anyone know how much time I've taken up so far? Have I already taken? Mm -hmm. Good time. Oh. Well, anyway. We have plenty of time. Okay. Well, I was going to t talk here about the fact that when you lower a standard, you also increase the proportion the disadvantaged group makes up of persons who fail to meet the standard and who meet the standard, as I show in there. I'm going to skip over this because I really don't have time for it, but this is a quite important thing with regard to Ferguson, Missouri. For in Ferguson, Missouri, the Department of Justice's um, March 2015 investigative report and its February 2016 lawsuit regarding Ferguson, Missouri are based on understandings of the effects of practices on the proportion African Americans make up of persons experiencing adverse outcomes that is the exact opposite of reality. If you make the, uh, it's the DOJ attributes this to overpleasing and unduly harsh court procedures. If you, but if you reduce, generally reduce arrests, you generally relax the harshness of the court procedures, you tend to increase not decrease the proportion African Americans make up of persons experiencing adverse interactions with the police and the courts. So, does relaxing a standard increase or decrease the disparate impact? For it will reduce the relative difference in one outcome while it increases the relative difference in the other outcome. Well, if meeting or failing to meet the standard dictates the ultimate outcome for both groups. There really is no basis for arguing that the, where the cutoff makes any differences to the adverse impact. If, but if it's only part of the process, then it becomes a very difficult issue. And too difficult an issue to address here, but I have addressed it in these 
references here, which if you look at this PowerPoint on my webpage, you'll be able to click on these and go to those references. So when will the government learn and how can it not know this? <laughs> well, I'll take the second question first, and it doesn't know this because neither does the scientific community. These are letters to these various entities of uh, explaining to them how practically nothing they do in the analysis of group differences is sound because they fail to understand the way the measure they employ tends to be affected by the frequency of an outcome. Thus, they don't look at data and say, what can this tell me apart from what do these patterns tell me about processes as distinguished from what they show me of what, what typically happens when the um, frequency of an outcome changes. No one does that. Consequently, very little uh, in the analysis of demographic differences provides useful information. Now, one of these items is a letter to the American Statistical Association, a very long one, very comprehensive, urging the American Statistical Association to address this, but also to explain to the U.S. government that reducing the frequency of an outcome tends to increase, not decrease, relative differences in rates of experiencing it. Maybe, if I continue to press it, the American Statistical Association will, will get around to doing that. But we'll see. More likely, this issue will get aired in a litigation, because in a litigation, the defendant is in a position, if it fully grasps all these issues, to confront the government with how it's measuring things and um, um, force it to recognize that much of what it does is based on an understanding that's exactly the opposite of reality. This, uh, I have not time for this, but just three, these several things that one needs to know in analyzing discrimination issues. One is that none of the standard measures is any good. Second, you can't analyze it a disparity on the basis of the proportion the group makes up of the pool and the portion makes up of persons experiencing an outcome. And third, that almost all successful litigations involve, um, highly successful litigations involve looking solely at persons who, who ex accepted some situation, either the most desirable or a lesser desirable situation. And none of these analyses are sound, not because people forfeit their right to uh, a discrimination claim because they um, accepted some situation, but simply because the analysis is only looking at a part of the picture. It's only looking at persons who said yes to something, not looking at the persons who said no to something. Um, it's all on that PowerPoint that you can find on my uh, website. Thank you very much. Jim, how, how, um, how helpful is it, th these justifications for an employer, let's say they get sued, these justifications that, uh, that, that, that tend to justify what the employer has done, but were not the reasons why they did it, such that, uh, you know, they're sort of after the fact justifications, and, and if they may really have done it for other reasons, how much, how much good does that serve? them um, well, I, don't I mean know or do they have to th like think all this out before anybody even complains well uh, that uh, you're raising a, a couple tooth issues there one what's the real motivation uh, and uh, you know that's a I'll say that's a complex issue that um, uh, that I'm not, that's, that's a little far enough from, from what I just talked about that I don't think I'm in a very good position to answer it right here. I'm just thinking about the complexity of this from the standpoint of a medium to small size employer that, you know, well, they're trying to do their best and really don't even have the resources to consider all this in advance, let alone after they get sued and then they're in the position of having to prove their innocence rather than have the government or the plaintiff prove their guilt, in which case, as a practical matter, they fold their tent. Well, I think uh, one can certainly say, is uh, asking the little employer or the large employer to understand these issues when the government so manifestly fails to understand them 
is asking a great deal. Indeed. And that also goes, of course, to, I mean, I think Jim will talk about real justification for things. Um, and um, I'll give him the floor. I'll take that as a segue. Talk about interference with, interference with innovation. First of all, thank Roger Clegg for uh, inviting and, me. And I didn't, and I should have introduced well, you, that's Jim. All right. That's all right. That's no, no. That, but, you know, <laughs> Washington attorney with great experience, been around this, I guess, almost as long I've as I have. Of a almost as long things, as I but, have. But not an attorney. Uh, <laughs> uh, oh, I'm sorry. I, I'm sorry. Actually, actually, that's a great segue because uh, I've been asked if I, because I give legal advice oftentimes to, in the context of employment. And I say, you know, uh, if I were an attorney, you could hold me accountable for my opinions, but I'm not Psychologist, an psychologist. Yes, thank you. Thank and, you. And, and, and deeply involved in selection procedures and legally defensible employment testing. Back probably even as long as I've been in the Long of tooth, yes. Uh, Jim Scharf, I'm a, an industrial psychologist, and my field is studying, reliably studying individual differences and particularly in use of those individual differences and how they apply in the workplace. So validation studies are what the, showing the difference between, or the relationship between individual differences and job performance. And that's basically the, what I'm gonna be talking around this afternoon. Uh, I came to Washington in the School of Business as a fresh out an industrial psychologist. I had been a chemistry major as an undergrad. I'd never had a political science course. I didn't know anything about the law. And I used to have, uh, Griggs had come down. I was in the business school. So I'd have the chief industrial psychologist at EEOC come out and talk to my MBA students. And it was sort of a professional jolly that the MBA students could give the uh, chief psychologist at EEOC a rough, rough time about, about job relatedness, the validation kinds of how we go about showing job relatedness. And uh, the late Bill Ennis, uh, the chief psychologist, said, uh, we have a, uh, an opportunity. There is a Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under Law is about to sue the Civil Service Commission, the now Office of Personal Management. Uh, are you interested? And I thought, geez, here's an opportunity to learn about the law. Well, the first thing I learned about the law was the meaning of the phrase pro bono, you know. So, <laughs> but uh, what happened was the uh, Lawyers Committee sur successfully sued the then Civil Service Commission, uh, and that's the handout. If you have a handout, I'm going to roughly uh, follow it along. Um, the agencies, the, uh, the plaintiff's bar said, uh, the lawyer's committee said, the problem is the agency, that is the Civil Service Commission's use of general ability tests, which are not aimed at any direct relationship to specific jobs. So that was the, that was the, uh, that was the complaint uh, that was successful in the, in the federal court uh, back in the, in the early 70s, which led to the work between the Department of Justice Civil Rights Division, the Office of Federal Contract Compliance Programs and the Department of Labor, uh, the EEOC, and the Civil Service Commission. Now, Civil Service Commission, of course, is the, at that point for Walmart was the biggest employer in the United States. So you had an employer and three enforcement agencies uh, trying to negotiate uniform guidelines. That took a, uh, I was then at that point hired uh, to uh, uh, work at the EEOC, and I worked from 74 to 78 on the negotiation of the uniform guidelines, which took those four agencies, DOJ, DOL, EEOC, and the then Civil Service Commission. The result was a set of uniform guidelines between the enforcement agencies issued in 1978. Uh, during that time, the Civil Service Commission had hired, this is my num point number three, uh, an industrial psychologist from Michigan State, Frank Schmidt, based on his peer review meta-analysis of criterion-related validity studies. Schmidt and Hunter's validity generalization was disruptive innovation in support of the Civil Service Commission's defense of the Federal Service Entrance Exam using general ability tests. And what Frank Schmidt's work, that he's been recognized worldwide now for, was that general cognitive ability is the best predictor of job performance. The more complex the job, the better the prediction. So EEOC's uh, attorneys and the Department of Justice, of course, was listening to the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under Law, who specifically said uh, validity generalization is the, you know, the garlic for the vampire. Uh, 
they said we uh, have want nothing at all to do with this idea of validity generalization in fact so the uniform guidelines were based on two principles, that is specificity and single group validity, that you had to show validity of a selection procedure in each and every location for each and every job. So it was going back down, looking at the other end of the telescope, they didn't want anything that was generalizable. And furthermore, they said it was an assumption that if a test was valid for whites, it might not be valid for minorities. And so we had to investigate separately validity studies for minority groups in order to be full in compliance. So you had to look at validity for each location. When I was challenged by EEOC for a case that, uh, that we settled, uh, it was uh, OFCCP. Uh, Timken, a privately held company making bearings, uh, wheel bearings, uh, had a validity study in Ohio at their manufacturing plant in Ohio. They had a bearing plant down in southwest Virginia, uh, and the, the OFCCP said that validity study in Ohio doesn't apply down here in the plant uh, that was not unionized in Virginia because you are cross-training. And those individuals are performing not just the job that, that the validity study was done on, but they were Everyone on that shift was, was cross-trained. The job is even more complex and the validity is even better from a research standpoint. But EEOC said you had to show, or OSCCP said you had to show the validity in that particular location. Uh, we ended up winning that uh, particular decision. Uh, the, the, the uniform guidelines, uh, uh, number five is the chief of the civil rights, the late da or David Rose, who some of you uh, long of tooth uh, may name you may recognize. Read along with me. Under EEOC's present guidelines, this is a briefing to the Deputy Attorney General back in 1976. Under the present EEOC guidelines, few employers are able to show the validity of any of their selection procedures and the risk of their being held unlawful is high. Since not only tests but all other procedures must be validated, the thrust of the present guidelines is to place almost all test users in a posture of non-compliance to give great discretion to enforcement personnel to determine who should be prosecuted and to set aside objective selection procedures in favor of numerical hiring. The numerical hiring, which is Jim's lowering the standard making adverse impact disappear. Now validity generalization, which is the phrase that Frank Schmidt brought to the Civil Service Commission and did the briefing to the negotiators of the uniform guidelines who turned their back on it, Measures of cognitive ability, that is verbal quantitative problem solving, are the best predictors of job performance. The more complex the job, the better the prediction. The Civil Service Commission recruited Frank Schmidt because of his peer-reviewed validity generalization supported the Commission's contention that federal hires needed verbal and quantitative skills. Okay. Number seven, top of next page. Uh, the plaintiff's bar lobbied DOJ Civil Rights Division to reject validity generalization. I'll have all this in article form if you need the citations on it. Acceptance of this approach, Schmidt and Hunter, 81, would end any need for an employee to perform any study of the validity of a test which operates to exclude minorities or women at a disproportionately high rate. Validity would always be presumed and it would necessarily follow that no employer could ever lose a testing case. So they're obviously looking at it from a litigation standpoint, not from a utility, from validity, from contribution to productivity standpoint. Now, point number eight, adverse impact. I take adverse impact as a given. Any objective assessment has adverse impact. There are, there, there are differences in selection rates because there are differences on the average between applicant populations. Adverse impact is not going to disappear. Validity generalization is the general rebuttal to adverse impact. The plaintiff's bar is highly unlikely to agree to revising EEOC's uniform guidelines because validity generalization is not only the general case regarding the predictability of measures of general cognitive ability, uh, validity generalization is also the general rebuttal to adverse impact statistical definition of discrimination. Uh, just as an aside, when Clarence Thomas was the uh, chair at EEOC and had read some of the things I had but had, had been put on his desk that I had written, called me over, a uh, can of Coke on the desk, feet up on the desk, talking for about an hour. He said, um, Sheriff, <coughs> you've been around. Uh, he said, in fact, Ken Masugi here is the one that got me hooked up with Clarence Thomas. Uh, he said, you've been around. How did we get stuck enforcing a statistical definition of discrimination? Good question. Uh, 
and the, obviously it's the, the Griggs decision in the Supreme Court created that definition of adverse impact nowhere found in the legislative history, as you all know. Now, the uniform guidelines, point number 10, the, e, the plaintiff's bar, you can read that, is obviously adamantly opposed to revising the uniform guidelines because they don't want to get anywhere close to what the peer-reviewed literature shows about general cognitive ability as a predictor of job performance. The uniform guidelines have not been revised since 1978, and I resigned from EEOC uh, before the guidelines were issued because I was not about to become the spokesman for specificity and single group validity, both of which had been now in the peer-reviewed literature in my field, the research had, had, had in fact been rebutted as, a, as a, an empirical finding in peer-reviewed uh, literature. The National Academy of Sciences endorsed validity generalization subsequently in point 11. Contemporary industrial psychology, uh, we have uh, in, revised both the American Psychological Standards for Educational and Psychological Tests and the Society of Industrial Organizational Psychology Principles for the Validation and Use of Employee Selection Procedures have been revised five times in the, in the intervening period since the uniform guidelines were issued. So validity generalization has been accepted by the courts. Uh, and as the, one of the judges early on in 1978 said, quote, in this point 11, uh, subparagraph 11 here, to require local validation in every city, village, and hamlet would be ludicrous. At least one judge saw the, uh, the, the, the shortcoming of requiring situational specificity to be investigated in each and every location. Uh, and that was a firefighter case in bringing validity evidence from the state of California, where they had big cooperative studies, to a, a hamlet in Virginia. And uh, the judge said, uh, hey, a firefighter is a firefighter is a firefighter. Okay. I have successfully defended validity generalization in, uh, in federal court. Uh, my reasoning has been upheld uh, uh, by the Fifth Circuit. I have successfully uh, rebutted uh, challenges by EEOC and by OFCCP. Um, the, the uniform guidelines foundation is based on what we call job analysis. And, and uh, I quoted the relevant sections out of the guidelines there, I need not to go into it. But what I want you to bring to your attention is then in, in, in paragraph 14, this is the, the rationale that I've used for turning to the ONET for what I'm going to show you is, is the breakthrough, the innovative breakthrough that, that I'm working on right now. Uh, uh, it's a Walter Lippmann, who was a, uh, a journalist here in Washington of my parents' generation, said Washington is a town uh, overwhelmed with data about which there's lots of information, some knowledge, and virtually no wisdom. So the <laughs> data elements are the job each job in the occupational, in the ONET, which is published by the U.S. Department of Labor, about a thousand of our jobs in our, it's post uh, 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 smokestack Rust Belt economy now. Uh, the ONET describes the knowledge, skills, abilities, tasks, work styles, and each of those, each of those job descriptions in the ONET is the, are the elements of the data that we then organize into information where we're building uh, uh, job families, which I'll show you in a moment. And when we start looking at job families and averaging of those job descriptions, the, the knowledge, skills, ability requirements in those job families, we then have the opportunity, a bigger, more reliable data set to deal with, and a nationally normed data set at that. But we can take and look across then across job families to see what are what do we have in common in terms of the ability requirements, the, the skill requirements for different job families. How much can we build? And this is sort of common law, if you will, building from the ground up. We're 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 building this validity generalization mountain based on the precedent, just as common law does. So right now I've been I've been working with a, a healthcare client uh, that has uh, uh, 87,000 employees in 26 states. I've been reporting to their general counsel now for nine years. And the work that, uh, that we're doing in that, we're, our beta site is in western Michigan, but it's, uh, we've been working with the Hope Street Group, uh, 
not profit, not for profit out of New York City, and for the educational testing service to assess legally defensible job related competencies in healthcare and the manufacturing sectors so that employers will be able to communicate talent supply chain competencies to individuals and to talent suppliers to align competency based education with employment requirements. That's a long way of a, a mouthful of saying. What I'm going to show you now, if you turn to the next page, this is uh, uh, just a, a, a peek at the very first of the spreadsheet for starting with the environmental service, job family, nutrition service, patient care, registered nurse, and you can see the specific jobs that are entitled, uh, that are that are averaged within that. That's just to show you what how we start building the data. These are the data elements that go into what is then on the next page, where we're the color chart, which has the greens, the yellows, the reds, and these are now the 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 major job families in healthcare. We're talking about uh, 17 uh, job families uh, uh, listed across the top, and starting with the knowledge, the skills, and then they, the, what, what you don't have is the rest of this handout, which are the abilities, the tasks, the uh, uh, work styles. But what we are able to do then is over on the final page of your handout there is to do a test specification basically saying based on our national ONET database building from the specific job descriptions, the data element, to the information uh, which is the job family, to the knowledge that is abilities in common across jobs in this whole sector of healthcare sector, we now get to the wisdom where we're working with ETS to use both predictors of cognitive and non-cognitive. We're in an, uh, actually using adaptive personality measures as part of the complete looking at, at both the cognitive and non-cognitive requirements for job performance. Where does this get us in terms of this, this challenge being uh, the EEO regulations have stifled talent supply chain innovation, which is the title of my talk. Well, the, the, the market presently in employment is a pull. Employer tests the applicant. What we see, and we're working specifically with community colleges that are working to, the, to, to, to develop the talent that's coming into those staff jobs in the hospital sector, the ho we're dealing with a competency assessment for intake at the community college level and showing them these are the competencies for various job families in the healthcare sector. What is going to be we're going to be moving in, 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 in the near term, my nickel is, bet is from a pull, that is the employer testing, to a push where the individual applicant is going to be getting skill, ability, certification, and independently having that verified on a certification body, a badge certification body. So it's stackable credentials that an applicant will show that is independently verified by, by a, a body out there. So that's where, where I think uh, uh, the innovation is. It's uh, competency-based, um, and uh, I'm sure in a question session, uh, that's 40 years of I.O. Thank you. Thanks, Jim. Uh, let's begin. To, uh, any of our presenters want to raise a question with respect to any of the other presenters before we turn to the audience? I guess no. Can take one. Okay. Well, then, how about uh, you folks out there beyond the, all the bright lights? Um, anybody have any uh, questions you'd like to raise? It's an interesting, these are interesting topics and it's hard to get to conclusions about them. Roger has a question. Go ahead, Roger. Hi, I'm uh, Roger Clegg with the Center for Equal Opportunity and uh, I guess this is mostly directed to uh, Mr. Scanlon but I'd welcome answers from, from uh, any of the panelists. Um, is there any uh, reason why uh, when you get sued the challenge has to be to pass rates as opposed to failure rates when it comes to disparate impact. That is, can an employer uh, who's, who's trying to avoid one 
kind of disparate impact and aggravates the other kind of disparate impact is it, is he uh, is there any reason in, in, in the law or the case law why he, he couldn't get sued either way whatever he did and if the answer to that question is yes uh, he, you know he I mean, that that is that he, he is vulnerable you know either way isn't this evidence that we need to get rid of the whole disparate impact approach. Um, well, the answer, I guess, is yes. There are certain circumstances where the tendency will be generally to measure in relative differences in pass rates. And um, I, uh, in the uh, in the article I wrote about this um, preparatory to this conference, it's about the potential. Um, unconstitutional vagueness of the disparate impact doctrine. And, um, you know, I don't know, um, and there, so long as practically no one understands how actually to measure an impact, there's some, something to be said for that. If you ask Congress what they intended, they have no idea what the difference is between the relative difference in success and relative difference in failure, and probably they will not for generations. Um, so I think the vagueness argument is a reason to uh, get rid of the disparate impact argument or uh, doctrine. But I uh, um, I see that well as the uh, it may be sort of a, a due process argument as well. Um, so to the so that would be the basis either some general due process or vagueness claim. Um, I don't know that the, you know, that the things change in opposite directions necessarily means that there can be no sense to a disparate impact doctrine. And as I explained there, trying to say whether one, I guess the best way to approach it is from the question of their, their the employer always has to choose the less discriminatory alternative. And that is the conundrum. Um, the conundrum both in understanding um, that the two measures change in opposite direction, and the conundrum, um, and not necessarily a logical conundrum, but in figuring out which, um, whether a higher or lower standard in fact uh, has a, um, a larger or smaller impact in the particular setting. These are, as I say, it's very comp trying to figure, sometimes a higher cutoff um, has a smaller impact. And what I'll use the term properly measured, some more commonly the lower cutoff has the um, smaller impact properly measured. But that all depends on what happens to the people who get through the first barrier. I mean, if, well. Well, if I could ask a, a follow-up to that, and this, I think would yeah, let especially me, go to all, all the panelists. But, let, uh, let me take a shot yeah. at that. Uh, the, the plaintiff's bar, the civil rights community, is not about to, to, to back off of a statistical definition of discrimination. It is a very good sub-Rosa sub egalitarian equality of results definition that but for discrimination you'll have equality of results. That is a redistributive writ large in capital letters. Why would the plaintiff's bar, why would the civil rights community ever entertain dealing with that? It, it, Eleanor Holmes Norton was my boss when I re retired, resigned from EEOC in 78. I, I asked her naively one time, I said, why, why, why aren't we just incorporating all the enforcement agencies under one umbrella? She said, stupid, <laughs> because they're in, each of them has a constituency, and each of them will, in fact, have a, have a, uh, a, a tug on uh, Congress's sleeve uh, if, uh, if, ever, uh, if ever challenged. Now, your, your, your question about, uh, about outcomes, uh, one of the things that we're showing, it, the, the definition, I went back to government as a, as a special assistant to, to then the late Evan Kemp as a, uh, and, and helped in negotiation of the Civil Rights Act of 1991, which incorporated, it, it, without any legislative history at all, 
the, the precedent of the Griggs statistical definition of discrimination. So there is no legislative history about a statistical definition of the discrimination. But the, 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 the burden, if there is adverse impact, the burden is job-related for the position in question and consistent with business necessity. And as Gail pointed out earlier, there, there's never been any, any guidance as to what business necessity is. So one of the things we can show right now in the work that we're doing in, in hospitality, in, in the healthcare sector, is we've been able to reduce uh, first-year attrition with a valid assessments uh, from uh, over 20% to down around 12% uh, with the savings, and this is just in the Western Arbata site in the Western re region of Michigan. This beta site had 8,600 employees and 2,413 different job codes. How are you going to do a validity study that, that is based on 2,014, 2,413 different job codes, each of which has maybe three or four employees in it? All right, so. But we, we were able to, to, to show the, the, the savings by the implementation, in, implementation of these objective assessments, uh, reduction in, in annual turnover, and the savings in Western Michigan in, 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 of several million dollars annually by first year attrition reductions alone. That's business necessity. And interestingly enough, if you're interested, I can give you the, the link. The White House has done a, 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 a convened a, a meeting of uh, leading health care, looking at the whole health care, the health care job uh, universe uh, in March. And they cited our work at, with Trinity Health in, in Western Michigan as, a, uh, a, as a, an example of translating competencies back out into the workplace and dealing with this as a more comprehensive talent supply chain management. So if any of you are interested in, in, in all of the details, the backup on all this, I'll be glad to just drop me a business, give me a business card and I'll be glad to follow up on that. So it's business necessity. I mean, a reduction of turnover is, is certainly is a business necessity. Can I just add a little bit about business necessity here? The, the, if you look at the literature, uh, the disagreement is just unbelievable on what business necessity means. There are our commentators, um, you know, in prominent law reviews who argue that if it won't cause the company to go bankrupt, uh, then it's not, you know, a, a business necessity. They'll go that far. So they wouldn't agree with you that that rate of attrition was, was, was uh, a business necessity unless the company would actually go bankrupt. Um, other people argue way out in the other direction that if you, you, can, if you can articulate a reason that doesn't, like, make you blush, then that's, that's um, business necessity. But that's the problem is nobody knows what it means. May I add a couple of things? One, uh, uh, about business necessity, because one of the, uh, back in the 70s, when people would argue for this, that you have to go bankrupt towards. One of the big cases was U.S. v. Bethlehem Steel, which of course is no longer around. Um, but an important thing that with regard to the disparate impact, although it doesn't, my, my points only play into it tangentially, is that disparate impact has migrated into a way of proving disparate treatment. You, it's, you, any statistical case nowadays is said to be the disparate impact of the subjective employment practices. Mm -hmm. And so that's um, my whether you lower or raise the standard doesn't play so much into that. But it's, um, it allow, everything would be much better off if disparate impact were never mentioned in a case other than one that is focused on a real practice and not a fuzzy practice like um, supposed um, uh, subjectivity in the, in the selection process. Yeah, I'm playing off of Jim. Uh, what's the difference between uh, disparate treatment and disparate impact? Well, the Civil Rights Act of, of 91, a disparate treatment case gets argued before a jury, a disparate impact case gets bef uh, uh, argued before a judge. And the plaintiffs obviously have a substantially better batting average before juries than they do before a judge. Well, so, as I recall, you, any, you, any you can good, get damages only, the, any the damages good, yeah. that... Oh, uh, and speaking of damages, uh, uh, Gail was mentioning uh, uh, damages. Uh, a state like Michigan has incorporated uh, the uniform guidelines as their, their definition of rebuttal burden, but the, the reason that the state law is, is cited when we're dealing with class actions in, litig in litigation is there is no cap on punitive and compensatory damages that are, that are incorporated into the federal statute. 
So we have state law being, uh, being uh, in, 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 in uh, uh, Detroit Edison is a case of where I've gone through multiple class actions under state law uh, uh, because there is no cap on, on, uh, on uh, uh, damage awards. Gail, does that play to your? Well, you know, you've, yeah. you've well, my follow-up question was going to be, and this uh, is based on something that you said, uh, uh, Mr. Scharf, and that is, um, you know, given the, the problems that Mr. Scanlon's identified with, you know, wh whichever way you jump, uh, you know, you can, you can be in trouble, is there a way to um, advocate for reform in this area that would appeal to the left as well as the right? You? <laughs> Roger, <laughs> that's a really hard question. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, a reform that it would appeal to. You know, one of the things that, that concerns me uh, that I hope the left becomes interested in is the extent to which some of these, these um, disparate impact arguments end up creating um, fertile ground for actual race and sex discrimination. Um, and the more that that can be drawn to the attention um, of those who don't usually come to Federalist Society meetings, I think the better. And I think a good example of that um, is the EEOC's policy on criminal background checks. Um, the EEOC takes the position, and factually this is correct, African American and Hispanic males are more likely to have felony convictions um, than white males. And for that matter, although they didn't add this, um, all males are more likely to have felony convictions than females generally. Um, and so, yeah, there's a very clear disparate impact. If you've got an employer out there who says, I don't want to hire somebody with a felony conviction, that's going to operate to the, to the, um, to the um, advantage, especially of Asian females, um, and especially against African American males, um, you know, with each group being a little different. Uh, but contrary to, I think, the, the, the EEOC's position, it is not necessarily so that if you make it very difficult uh, for an employer um, to, to um, act on information on a job applicant's criminal background, that that's going to help African American males. If you're afraid to check, uh, as some employers are these days, instead there's going to be, you know, a, a, an incentive to say, well, I'm just going to steer away from the groups that I think are most likely. Um, to, to have felony convictions. That's not a great thing. The same with credit checks. Um, you know, um, whites are less likely to have, have um, a, a, um, a blot on their credit uh, evaluations than African Americans are, though lots and lots and lots of people uh, have blots on their credit evaluations. Um, but if you tell people, look, you can't look at this, they're more likely to act on stereotypes, which is exactly what we don't want, Title VII. Uh, that's what we're trying to prohibit, is actual uh, discriminatory treatment. Um, and so the more that area is studied, uh, and the more I think it becomes clear uh, that sometimes what's, what happens, and sometimes it's not even conscious, you know? Um, Imagine, you know, that you run a small moving business um, and you happen to have, you know, a location in an area where there are lots of, of, of young African-American males um, and many of them are not high school graduates. You hire them to, 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 to um, engage in, in, in your moving business, you know, within the city. It's a small business. Um, and suddenly your lawyer tells you, do not check people's criminal backgrounds ever, ever, ever again. And you say, hey, wait a second, I've got people going into people's homes. They can, like, steal something. I gotta, I gotta have some way of screening out, um, you know, employees who, who will engage in bad behavior. And like, you know, you, you, you do what your lawyer tells you to do. You don't, you, don't, you don't conduct background checks anymore. And, you know, maybe related to that or maybe not related to that because you never did the background check. You've had some bad experiences with the employees that you've, you've hired lately. You don't know whether they had a criminal background or not, but you do know that they turned out to be, you know, trouble. And you decide, you know what I'm gonna start doing? I'm gonna start hiring part-time 
uh, moving people from the local, you know, liberal arts college up on the hill, uh, where you have to have a pretty darn, you know, good SAT to get in. Uh, and, you know, I can get these guys to work for me and gals to work for me for like, you know, 10 hours a week. I'll just hire four times more of them. Uh, and I bet I'm going to get some better employees. Race is the last thing on your mind. You're not thinking about race. That's not why you did it. Uh, but what you did is you, in fact, went to a pool that may have fewer minorities in it and therefore racial minorities, African-American males in particular, are going to end up being disadvantaged. People make decisions like that all the time. Um, and the clearer it becomes that disparate impact uh, is backfiring in many cases, I think the easier it will be uh, to get legislative reform. Let, let me give you a, 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 a little take on that excellent presentation from the uh, Council with Uber at lunch today. The city of Austin is requiring fingerprints. Fingerprints are a database of arrests. If I were advising Uber, I'd say put some money on the NAACP local chapter to put a class action together because arrest records are, dis are not defensible. It's convictions. It's not arrests. You could blow that, that, that piece of legislation out of the water that fast with a class action. I, I, I agree that you're much more likely to have, have lawsuits over arrest records uh, than conviction records. And, and Although I would also say that that's because of disparate impact law, which doesn't make a heck of yeah. a lot of sense. I mean, I ask all of you, you have a choice between two babysitters uh, for your, your young children, one who has an arrest record as long as your arm, but who's never been convicted, uh, and the other who has no arrest record, which babysitter do you want for your child? Uh, I think the choice is easy, uh, but it's certainly true. Uh, that an arrest record um, case, you know, if, if that's the, the, the route they're taking in Austin, they are much more likely to get a lawsuit out of that than they will out of, out, out of convictions. Of course, a, a disqualification for a conviction, of course, has a much larger relative difference in the adverse outcome than disqualification for arrest. So the more you narrow the disqualifier, the greater is the perception of the disparity. Is there time for one more question? Are we done? Sure. Um, so I've heard a lot of criticism of the statistical definition of discrimination, which applies to disparate impact. It's also, as you referenced, getting imported into the, the disparate treatment class actions. Um, in this alternate universe, do you of where this, that's, this is not the case, do you see any positive role for statistical analysis in big discrimination cases? Is there? Positive. I, I hear a lot of criticism why the statistical measures and well, analysis don't sort of serve the ultimate interest. Is there any, any positive role for it? When it's being used to prove actual discrimination, uh, where it does have some probative value, it's just not by itself, um, you know, sufficient to do that. Um, but yeah, I mean... But now, it's, sorry, just to, to respond briefly, now the, the statistical measure of, of two or three standard deviations ends up being the same measure on disparate impact side and on sort of the disparate treatment side, right? Yeah, but it's still possible that it's, it's, it's lends some probative value to showing that this employer actually is purposely doing this. Uh, and, you know, the time the Griggs decision came down, even though the opinion it, itself, um, you know, seems to, to, to clearly really mean it when they say, hey, you know, the intention is not necessary here. You know, you could have, under a, you know, a good theory of, of stare decisis, say, yeah, but in fact, Duke Power Company was indeed discriminating purposely, and the fact that they instituted the particular tests that were being used in the Griggs case on the very day that Title VII went into effect shows that, it, at the very least, Title VII was a triggering event. They were reacting to Title VII. Um, and the leap from there um, to, and they did it on purpose, um, is not that great. The problem in the Griggs case was that the trial court had found that this was not intentional discrimination, that this was being done in good faith. And that's not impossible based on the facts. Um, but the Supreme Court, therefore, you know, had to say, look, that doesn't matter, even though those are the facts and we can't, we can't overturn those facts because they were not, you know, they were at least plausible from the evidence. Um, you know, it, the next case that came up 
could have said, well, you know, we, we were using it there as a, a, a proxy uh, for actual discrimination. Instead, the Supreme Court went even crazier the next round, and I, mean, I believe the next round was Albemarle Paper. Is that right? Yeah. Is that where, where they just like went off the deep end with, with the... Talking about going off the deep end, uh, I've actually published Scharf's bet that in our lifetime we will see the Supreme Court, obviously depending on a couple things, uh, overturn a statistical definition of discrimination. It's not going to come from the enforcement agencies. I, I, I'm, I'm positive of that. But I think the, uh, the exercise, uh, let me give you an example, because it was the, it was the Wunderlich test of cognitive ability that was the, used by the, the Griggs versus Duke Power Company. And uh, I successfully defended Southern Maryland Electric Cooperative. Any of you live in Prince George's County? SMECO is an electric cooperative. They're not part of the Edison Electric Institute, but they are a retailer of electricity that they get off of the grid. The, the uh, CEO called me in and he said, I'm tired of defending National Labor Relations Board cases because we have a policy of promoting from within and we're taking linemen or folks that are out working at the entry level that are, that are doing clearing, clearing bush and doing all the transmission lines and, and, and that. And we promote them and it's a, an environment with, with high voltages. They have to be able to read and understand safety directions and if they can't master training, they are out. And we get challenged because of the racial effect of having a, a, a promotion from within policy. I'm tired, he said, of defending NLRB cases, and I want you to help us defend our use of the Wunderlich test of general cognitive ability. EEOC was the party to that case. Now, it took four years to settle while my clock was running, of course, uh, but uh, it, uh, we uh, EEOC folded the tent. They, they basically backed off because we had a cumulative knowledge of the, the predictability of a cognitive ability measure like the Wunderlich, even though short form that it is, of uh, showing that in fact it is predictive of job performance. I should add here that, that Justice Scalia's concurrence in the Ricci case uh, brought up the issue of the constitutionality of disparate yeah. impact liability. And I worked, I worked for the plaintiffs in the Reese case before it even got to the district court, and, and I worked right up through the amicus brief to the Supreme Court, uh, working with the firefighters in the city of New Haven uh, uh, challenge that, uh, that went to the Supreme Court. And that was a great case in terms of, of, of these tests because um, the, the defendant in that case uh, had like jumped through a thousand hoops to make sure that that exam would be upheld. Um, it was really, you know, a, a tremendous undertaking and one that most small businesses would have no ability to do, uh, but the yeah. New Haven um, Fire Department was able to do and that. And the takeaway from that case, interestingly enough, is if you take, give an exam, look at the results, and then adjust the test scores afterwards to try and reduce the adverse impact, that'll get you in trouble. You've got to set those scores based on your expertise, whatever rationale you have. It is set before you give the test and not in response to the distribution of the test takers, because that is evidence of treating people differently on the basis of race. And one thing I dearly hope is, is, is that Scalia's willingness to question uh, disparate impact liability did not die with him. Um, I'm hoping that, that this issue will be addressed at some point uh, by the court. Um, pretty much all the speakers took for granted that um, not all groups are equal in different abilities for different jobs. Um, but that's certainly not taken for granted by our society and is actually probably uh, considered, you know, grounds for getting fired actually even. Um, and, you know, to the extent where people will acknowledge there might be different uh, rates of arrest or different test scores, they'll say that either the tests are racist or the police are being racist. So beyond just the law, you know, how much can we really change things unless be without, like how important do you think it is to get rid of these taboos about uh, discussing group differences? So, so women are gonna be as equally upper body strength as men, is that, I mean, you're, you're, you're talking, I can describe what is other people will take the liberty of telling me how it should be, 
but I can describe very well and reliably and defend it what is. Uh, the question you're asking is, well, the, the larger question about a statistical definition, it, the quality of results is the presumption that but for discrimination you'll have a quality of results. And it, it's, it, it was a pretty well kept under the, under, the, under the radar back in the 70s when we were negotiating the, the uniform guidelines. I mean, if you, if you knew what the literature was, you knew about ability differences. Today, it's no big secret because local school boards are having to deal with that. Look at Montgomery County, for example, for those of you that, that, are, that are in the Beltway. Yeah, there are going to be differences. I mean, the very fact that people, um, how people perform in school has some correlation to how people perform on the job, and there are very diff big differences in how people perform in school, so one can't dispute that. How do the dynamics of what we see today and the type of analysis we've been discussing <coughs> uh, take on what some people predict are, is to be an increase in reverse discrimination cases as opposed to the normal you know, complaint about uh, discrimination? Well, um, I mean, non-protected class anti or uh, reverse discrimination. Well, say again, you mean the, how does, how does what we're Yeah, I mean, we're really, we, we, we seem to be looking at this from the standpoint of this sort of complaintive or complaintive groups, plaintiff groups that are complaining about, you know, what has happened to their protected class. Well, some people, I mean, employers no doubt engage in some uh, race conscious or gender conscious action in order to avoid liability under a disparate treatment or disparate impact statistical case there's um, but it's been it's been observed or at least predicted that there will be more and more reverse discrimination cases as long as there's a plaintiff bar uh, there's going to be obviously uh, a class action and they're probably without being a statistician there probably be more white applicants than there are minority applicants so that's a pretty good sized class so I, I don't think that's going to be the case. Let, let, let me go. Give I you just a, I just want to say that yeah. I object to the term you know a non-protected class because Title VII doesn't doesn't have non-protected classes. It has you know non-protected classifications. So if you're saying I'm being discriminated against because I'm a Republican or because I'm a Democrat, then that's just not addressed. Uh, but a, a case of a white male is not a reverse discrimination case. It's a discrimination case. Um, and, you know, the, 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 as long as we understand that, yeah, there probably will be such cases. Um, and, you know, some of them will be meritorious and some of them won't be, just the same way as any other case. Um, and, you know, commenting about, you know, the last question here with, with um, you know, the fact that different groups really do have, you know, on average different characteristics, you know, I can predict. Um, who will win the, 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 the Boston Marathon? Well, odds are pretty good it will be somebody of East African um, extraction. Uh, who is going to win the Kentucky Derby? The odds are actually fairly good that it will be somebody, you know, that the jockey will be Hispanic. Not always, but it's pretty, the odds are quite high. Um, upper body strength, sure, you know, women are going to flunk that test relative to men, although not all women. Um, you know, there are a lot of different, different talents out there. And none of them um, is evenly distributed again over the thousands of ethnic groups, religious groups, um, sexes, races. Uh, it just doesn't happen that way. That said, there are people who have the talents for whatever job, um, you know, in coming in all different races, all different, different ethnicities, all different religions. And that's what Title VII is supposed to be about, to make sure that each of us uh, is judged by the talents uh, that we have and not by by what someone's perception of what our group um, is supposed to be about. Uh, not only when those stereotypes are false, but even when they're true, even when it's true that, that, that um, you know, people of my ethnic background don't do as well as Chinese Americans uh, or Korean Americans on math aptitude tests. But I don't want to be judged by, by whether people who are, are, are Scottish Presbyterians aren't very good at math. Uh, I want to be judged by whether I'm good at math. Um, or whether I'm not. Um, so, Gail, I want to give you my, in closing, my favorite story from California about protected classes. Uh, Borg Warner had uh, been, uh, uh, insurance companies require shopping malls and apartment complexes to have security 
24 hours. And those are non-sworn, i.e. they're not carrying a, a, a gun. Uh, and Borg Warner had been buying up mom and pop security operations around the country, okay? Uh, one of which was uh, from California. The case is now Borg Warner is before Justice Patel in, uh, in uh, San Francisco. And the argument was under California uh, uh, labor code, an employer may neither coerce nor deny political expression. So this was brought under California code, uh, labor code, and the, the questions on this questionnaire, this test that, that one of the local mom and pop uh, uh, rent-a-cop uh, shops in California had, had been using was, uh, your attitudes towards the legalization of marijuana. And this was back in the early 80s. And uh, Justice Patel ruled, and Borg Warner lost, that the question about drug legalization adversely impacted liberals. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, read, I quit. <laughs> yeah, I'm not going to touch that. <laughs> I want to thank uh, all of our panelists uh, for an interesting discussion and our audience. Good job. And I,